Uh, I suppose it's uh, here in California, we're good morning to everyone, but uh, on the East Coast, good afternoon. And those of you that are overseas, many of our uh, guests are in either in Germany or in Turkey. Uh, we wish them a good evening as well. Once again, I'm Professor Barlo Dermogradician of the Armenian uh, Studies Program. And this uh, program is part of our Armenian Studies uh, Fall Lecture Series. It is being live streamed on YouTube and you will be able to archive and watch it on the Armenian Studies YouTube channel uh, when you get a chance to do so. It was about two years ago uh, that Maggie Mangasarian Goshen approached me as the editor of the Armenian series of the press at California State University, Fresno, about a potential manuscript to be published in our Armenian series at Fresno State. That manuscript was the memoir of Setrak Timurian. And after further discussions and reading excerpts from the memoir, the press accepted the work. Uh, and we are here today to discuss the publication of the final product, which is volume 19 in the Armenian series at California State University, Fresno. Uh, of course, uh, a work such as this is the work of many people. Uh, the translator of the book was N. Ipek Huner. And today we'll also be joined by the editors, Dr. Vahe Tashian, Dr. Yashar Tolga Jora, and Dr. Murat Jankara, as well as Maggie Mangasarian Goshen, who are each gonna talk about various aspects uh, of the book and of their participation in the work of the book. We'll be allotting each of them approximately uh, 10 minutes to speak on their uh, topic. And at the conclusion of the presentation, uh, we will ask uh, you in the audience, if you would like to ask questions, to please use the chat function at the bottom of the Zoom uh, picture that you're looking at to ask your questions uh, in, uh, in the chat area. So today, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our guests. We're going to begin with Maggie Mangasarian Goshen, uh, who has been working as director of the Ararat Eskijian Museum for more than 25 years. She has organized numerous exhibitions and has been involved in many, many publications uh, as well. Uh, just about a year ago, year and a half ago, on February 26 to 27, 2022, the Ararat Eskijian Museum and the Armenian Dress and Textile Project presented an international conference and exhibition entitled 1860 Gesarya Kayseri to Los Angeles 2022, uh, which was an ex exhibition based on uh, the memoirs of Setrak Temurian and uh, a collection of, 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 her, of his granddaughter, Nazali Elmas, uh, Elmasian's uh, work. So today I'm going to be asking uh, Maggie to talk about uh, her participation in this work because I believe she is the one that really uh, brought this work to light. So Maggie, welcome to our presentation and I'm gonna hand it over to you, thank you. Thank you, Barlow, and thank you everyone who's watching us. It has been a great milestone to come thus far and thanks to our researchers, scholars, editor, and the family, uh, the uh, Elmasian Timurian family for facilitating for us to come thus far. My journey began about 2016. I received a call from Nazali through a friend, uh, Dr. Sophie Kartwanian, to visit the family because she wanted to give some of the family heirlooms to the museum. I had known Nazali for many, many years. She was a veteran. She used to attend our veteran, Armenian American Veterans Day events as we are today. And I did not know that she was the family uh, keeper of the history of the heirlooms. Once we were at Nazali's house, I was already in a time warp. I thought I was going back to Kayseri. The beautiful de decorations, the pictures, the family heirlooms. Eventually, Dr. Mary Villarreal, who also joined us, who had worked with uh, Dr. Kachmanian to go over the heirlooms, Nazali called me into the library and she gave me the manuscript and she said, this is my grandfather's uh, manuscript. What can you do with it? Would you take it to the museum? Of course, I will take it to the museum, but in my mind, what am I going to do with it? But of course, with it came in a summary of the book uh, that was uh, that was translated by a family friend. Uh, but it was just a summary. And for, for a year or two sat in the library, and every day I used to go and touch the book, and I said, when is your time going to come? Until Vahe Tashjan paid us a visit in Los Angeles, and then things evolved differently. We met uh, Dr. Tolak, uh, to, uh, Tolga Kora, and then the project began with the blessing of the, the Nazali Elmasian and the family. And in all, all along in my mind was that there has to be a conference on Kayseri based on this project, because 
reading just the, 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 the summary gave me a glimpse of how life was. The man was a visionary, Dr. Timurian, and this is that brought us to here. So I want, I'm eternally grateful to everyone involved. It took a village to get this far, they say, and that's true. And I think the scholars put their utmost. It wasn't because they were commissioned, but they did more than that. It became a family book. It became an important book. So thank you, everyone, and back to you, Barlow. You're mute. Thank you, Maggie, for that uh, background on uh, your involvement. And I know you you have played an important role in, uh, in, in the whole production of this book. So once again, thank you. And so now we're going to uh, uh, ask our editors in order uh, to speak a little bit about their participation uh, in the book. And our first uh, guest will be Dr. Murat Jankara, uh, who is majored in history and the his history of uh, and theory of theater. And he received his doctorate in Turkish literature from Bill Kent University uh, with a dissertation entitled Empire and Novel, Placing Armeno-Turkish Novels in Ottoman Turkish Literary Historiography. And he focused on the novels uh, written by Ar Ottoman Armenians in the Turkish language using the Armenian script between 1850 and 1870. He is currently on the faculty of, uh, a member of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at the Social Sciences University of Ankara. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Murat uh, Jankara. Dr. Jankara. Uh, thank you, Paret says. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I would like to thank first to Tolga Jora for introducing Timurian's memoir to me and making me part of this project. He, he is the one, uh, he was the connection for me. Then to Ipe Kuner, our translator, Vahe, Professor Deb Mugardichan, our editors, and Maggie, and the Timurian family for making this book possible. It's It's been a great pleasure, and I cannot emphasize enough what this has meant to me and how much I've learned throughout this project. Uh, I've been working on Armeno-Turkish texts since 2005. It's been almost two decades now. I myself started with the alphabet, then worked on the first Turkish novels written in I mean, using the Armenian letters, uh, mainly in mid 19th century, then ended up floating around on, on the pages of the press, Armenian press, Armenian Turkish press, and now mens manuscripts. Here, I'll make a brief outline for those who may not be familiar with what this is all about. I mean, the, the, the context, then my colleagues will dive further into Setrak Timurian's memoir. Now, uh, what you'll hear for the following few minutes was really surprising and new when I first began to work on this issue. But now this somehow is turning into common knowledge for, for many people. I mean, uh, it even found its way to Wikipedia, which is, which is great, which is wonderful. And I've talk, talked about these a number of times. So sorry for those who are already familiar with the following information. Uh, what are we talking about when we talk about Armeno Turkish, Ayadar Turkeren, Tajigeren, Armeno Turkish, Armeno Turk? Mainly we're talking about the Turkish language written using the letters invented by Mesrov Mashtots, uh, mostly by and for uh, Turkophone Armenians, but that's not the whole picture. I mean, uh, throughout my research, uh, I've seen, I mean, I've come across evidence that it was not, Ar Armeno-Turkish was not limited to Armenians. I mean, Muslim Turks would learn the Armenian alphabet to read texts written in Armeno-Turkish or Orientalists uh, were interested in Armeno-Turkish because Armenian letters well represented Turkish sounds. So, um, for them, it was a great medium where they could find uh, spoken Turkish. As for the corpus, we know that Armeno Turkish manuscripts date back to the 14th century, beginning maybe with Armeno Kipchak. The printed works go back to the 18th century, beginning with uh, Mahitar's grammar printed in Armeno Turkish. Uh, the press, the Armenian 
Armenian Turkish press goes back to the 19, early 19th century. Uh, there is a bit of a classification issue there, but uh, that's not our concern here. And we're talking about more than 2,000 books when we're talking about the Armenian Turkish printed works, uh, nearly 400 plays, uh, over 100 periodicals printed in more than 200 printing houses and 50 cities. All this we owe to the work of Hasmik Stepanyan, her bibliography. So that the data, the, the numbers, the figures here are taken from her work. I mean, today we're more and more, I mean, uh, enhancing the corpus. Uh, and now we are aware that there is much more to this, especially in the form of manuscripts. Uh, one question when we're talking about Armeno Turkish and Armeno Turkish writing practice is the question why and how? I mean, why does such a thing exist? Why would the Armenians of the Ottoman Empire write Turkish using the Armenian alphabet? Uh, th there are many answers to this. I mean, but, but, uh, many possible uh, answers. One reason uh, was the, I mean, the, the first that comes to mind is the Quality, the, the the value attributed to the Armenian alphabet and its relationship its relation to the national identity national Armenian identity but that, that's I mean that's almost given uh, one thing that made the practice uh, uh, spread was missionary activities uh, I mean, the missionaries used the Armenian alphabet and the Turkish language written in the Armenian alphabet to reach the locals, uh, to disseminate the Bible, uh, to the local population, Armenian population of the Ottoman Empire. And then it triggered the counter missionary activities. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the Institutions, educational institutions, using uh, Armeno Turkish uh, as a medium to reach uh, again the local population. So um, the Armeno Turkish writing practice for an ordinary Ottoman Armenian was some somehow uh, the best way to reach written language because if you couldn't, uh, I mean, if you are incompetent in the classical language Krapar. Uh, and if you didn't, I mean, know modern written Armenian, because it was in the process of being, I mean, it was being developed at the time, then the best way to express yourself in written language was to use the Armenian letters combined with the language, which was either your primary or secondary language, whatever. It doesn't matter, but it was very practical. So, uh, this is the general picture, but what what has uh, throughout the decades uh, I've been working on this issue, what I've come to realize is that the printing Armeno Turkish world is, is just a small portion of the Armeno Turkish corpus, as you'll see in the case of Setrak Timurian. Uh, more and more, we've been uh, coming across texts being taken out of drawers and memoirs, testimonies, uh, diaries. So there is a lot to explore, explore in the world of Armeno Turkish, as in the case of Bahram Altunyan or Simon Arakelyan. Now, there is the question why would a survivor write using the Turkish language? I mean, th this is not an easy question to answer. And I will not go into the details of the memoir. Uh, I, uh, I'll leave it to Vahe and Tolga, and maybe in the discussion part, we'll be talking about it. So this is the uh, general 19th century armeno turkish printing world. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jankara, for that uh, informative background into what is Armeno Turkish, because I think it's important for our audience to understand the significance of that. Thank you very much. Our next guest is uh, Dr. Vahe Tashjan, 
uh, who was born in Lebanon and earned his uh, doctorate in history at the and civilization at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes uh, on Science et Sociale in Paris. And his research covers uh, the period of the French occupation of Cilicia, Syria, and Lebanon between the two world wars, uh, Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, and refugee problems in the Middle East. He is currently the chief editor of the very important Husha Madian website based in Berlin, uh, and is a, a scientific project whose aim is to reconstruct Ottoman Armenians' local history and uh, memory. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Vahe Tashyan, again, one of the co-editors on the volume that we are discussing today, Dr. Tashyan. Yeah, thanks, Barlo, for organizing this event, and uh, thanks, Murat. Uh, now I will shift our talk to the post-genocide period in the Armenian diaspora, and I will talk about the challenges to writing and publishing Armenian memoirs, mostly by uh, genocide survivors. And I will emphasize uh, on the case of this particular language, Armeno-Turkish text or Armeno-Turkish memoirs. Uh, in post-genocide years, uh, autobiographical uh, memoirs or victim testimonies, memory books, or as we call them, Pushamadians, began to appear in various Armenian uh, diasporic communities. Uh, the authors of these books attempted in their way to revitalize their Armenian past, their history, sometimes a collective history, sometimes family history, in their native places of the Ottoman Empire. And these books, uh, now I'm talking as a historian, uh, are extraordinary materials that allow us to understand the past the past Armenian life in the Ottoman Empire and to study them. Uh, despite the importance of memoirs uh, and memorial books, many such manuscripts remained unpublished during the lifetime of their authors. Until today, uh, it is possible to find a great number of unpublished memoirs counted, conserved in family homes or the archives of various institutions. One good example is the present book, uh, the one written by Cetrak Kimurian, and it was thanks to the efforts of Maggie and Barlow that this important work is now published almost a century after its completion. So my time is limited here, so therefore I will emphasize on just two or three points explaining why in post-genocide diaspora there were serious hurdles, obstacles of printing or publishing uh, such memoirs in uh, such memoirs uh, yeah, post-genocide memoirs. One of the reasons was, of course, the lack of financial means at a time when the majority of the diaspora and Armenians were refugees and living in mostly desperate conditions. Another factor has also to do with the domestic Armenian climate in the post-genocide period. The fact is that the Ottoman Armenian past and the genocide were transformed into a history about martyrs and heroes. And in an atmosphere of this kind, the story of, let's say, an ordinary memoirist like Setrak Timurian, the descriptions of his business activities, even his testimonies of the 1895 massacres in Kayseri, did not fit the Great Chronicle, or as we can call it, the history with a capital H, which was the trend uh, in post genocide times and long after. At that time, I'm talking about the 1920s, 1930s, the Armenian reviews, newspapers, and publishing houses were used to print, at that time, memoirs written mostly by intellectuals, old revolutionaries, clerics, politicians, in other words, works authored by the surviving main uh, public figures representing Ottoman Armenian society, or the new elite that uh, uh, figures became the new elite of the Armenian diaspora in the 1920s, 1930s. Of course, the exceptions are the memoirs whose publications was funded by the authors themselves. In the case of Setrak Timurian's memoirs, there is probably another main reason why the work waited so long to see the light. The manuscript is written in Armenian Turkish. Uh, so as we have heard from Murat, this was quite common among Turkish speaking Ottoman Armenians. However, during the post-genocide and post-Ottoman years, 
a process of cultural and identity transformations took place within former Ottoman Armenian communities settled now in the diaspora, mainly in the Middle East. We can observe during this process an intensification of the nationalist rhetoric designed to distinguish within Armenian culture what is authentically Armenian and what is direct Turkish Ottoman heritage and consequently to be excluded from that culture. And this dichotomy marked the interwar period of Armenian community life in the diaspora and in an environment marked by intolerance, several vectors of the intangible Armenian heritage were now targeted by the communal elite since they were viewed as belonging to the Turkish Ottoman heritage. Among them was the Turkish language, which was spoken, used by a great number of Armenian refugees settled in the diaspora, the Armenian dialects, some musical instruments, Sharki or Alaturka songs, specific church architecture, some theatrical performances, all of these were considered as non-Armenian. And the advocates of this kind of cultural transformation or restructuring applied the same persistence to the continued publications in Armeno Turkish. I will present here just two examples. Uh, the first one is the example of the journal Lipanan, Lebanon, which was published in Beirut, and it was bilingual, Armenian and armeno turkish In an editorial in 1927, Lipanan informed laconically that it was ceasing its armeno turkish section. The journal explains that there was not enough encouragement by the readers of that language, and at the same time, as it writes, a considerable number of readers of the Armenian section were unsatisfied with the existence of the Turkish language in the journal. This case cannot be ignored, added the journal. A brief glance at the Armenian press in the diaspora between the two old wars is enough to discern the large campaign waged by the promoters of the cultural change restructuring against the use of uh, Turkish in its different forms, among the Armenian communities, speaking in Turkish in homes, schools or streets, preaching sermons in Turkish, publishing books and newspapers in Armenian Turkish, and so on. And this is why I'm more inclined to think that the decision of the editors of Lipanan to terminate the Armenian Turkish section was a concession to the growing pressure against the use of Turkish in the Armenian diasporic environment. The evolution of this stance, I mean, about what position should we take uh, on the use of Armeno Turkish publications uh, in the 1920s, 1930s, is again very clear in the example of Bishop Papken Gülesarian, uh, Papken Gülesarian, who became later Catholicos of Cilicia or Coadjutor Catholicos. And uh, Bishop uh, Papken was born in Aintab. As he writes in one of his articles, his mother tongue was Turkish, his family language was Turkish, as it was the case of many Aintab uh, Armenian families. Besides the Armenian that he learned in school and later at the Armash uh, Seminary, uh, Bishop Papken mastered remarkably the Turkish language. For example, he was the one who translated into Armeno Turkish. Uh, and that was during his student years, the book of Lamentations called Narek, written by Gregory of Narek. And Bishop Papken has several interesting articles on the use of uh, Armenian Turkish. He published on this topic as he was the editor of uh, Louis Weekly, that was a religious uh, uh, weekly published in 1905 or 1906. That was the time when uh, Bishop Papken was the editor of that uh, weekly. He published again uh, a long article this time, uh, again on the topic of uh, Armenian Turkish in 1916, and that was in Fresno uh, in 1916 in Norgyank newspaper. And he wrote again uh, on the same issue in 1928 and this time in Aleppo. So because of love, uh, time lim limitations, I will not make here a detailed analysis of these articles of uh, Bishop Papken. However, what is interesting here is the explicit evolution of his position on this issue. In his 1928 and last article on this topic of Armeno-Turkish, 
we see a radicalization of its position. There is an orientation to reject completely the use of Armenian or Turkish in uh, Armenian environment. And we have the impression that he is on a mission, like many other Armenian intellectuals in that period, to restructure the Armenian identity. And to conclude, we do not know whether Timurian, Setrak Timurian, as he completed his memoirs in the 1930s, contacted Armenian printers or publishers around the world to negotiate with them the publication of his manuscript. What we know, however, during those times, the Armenian communal elite were restructuring and reinventing the Armenian culture and identity in a way that Turkish language and Armeno Turkish, the written expression of Turkish among many Armenians, were excluded from them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tashian, for uh, for that situ situation, uh, putting into context the, the importance of armeno turkish in Armenian culture. And we're going to have an opportunity to ask questions uh, of all of our participants again uh, at the end of our presentation. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tashian. Our, our uh, final uh, panelist is going to be, one again, one of our co-editors, Dr. Yashar Tolga Joda. Uh, Dr. Joda received his doctorate in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from the University of Chicago and served as a postdoctoral fellow at the Armenian Studies Program and History Department at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And he's currently an associate professor in the Department of History at Boazici University in Istanbul and is also currently the Secretary General of the History Foundation, Tari Vakfa. So I want to introduce uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Joda to speak uh, now about the uh, the Timurian uh, memoir directly. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a flu that I couldn't recover from for the last three weeks, so I apologize for my voice. And uh, I would like to start with a note that uh, we heard that the Nazaline's health wasn't great uh, recently, but very happy to learn that she is better now. Um, we only met her through the video that's in the organized, organized by Maggie, uh, which Barlow mentioned. Uh, and that video was very inspiring for us. I was very touched by it. So we have a bond with her through the memoirs as the Timurian family became a part of our lives in the last uh, three years. And another note before I get into the uh, discussion of the memoirs that uh, Murat Jankara, Dr. Uh, Jankara didn't mention uh, something that, and that is how we worked on the text. It was the pandemic period and we were all stuck at home and, but there was Zoom. We shared the screen and went through the text line by line and not once, but twice. And this was for the shifting the manuscript and then its transliteration. Translation was one, was another step, as the text was 19th century Anatolian Turkish, and that had to be carried out by an expert who can understand it. So I also thank translator Ipe Kuner, uh once again for that task. I will talk you about certain nuances uh, that you do not see or notice in the book when you hold it. I hope you will hold it, all of you. That's a very interesting text. But uh, the reason for those uh, that the nuances that are not seen or visible is that it has been transliterated from Armeno Turkish into Latin script and then edited and then translated. So there are certain layers. And I would like to talk about these layers that were in the Timur uh, Setrak Timurian's memoirs. Uh, from the point of view of language. That uh, Timurian, as we all know now, was from Kayseriye or Kayseri, and many uh, Armenians of the city were Turkophones, that is, they were Turkish speakers. And this was the same for the Greek Orthodox population of the broader region of Cappadocia or Cappadocia. And the Greek population, uh, of that region who are called Karamanlı, spoke Turkish, and just like the many Armenians, including Setrak Timurian, published in Turkish in Greek letters. Many Armenians published in Turkish in Armenian from that region. 
So Timurian's mother tongue was a uh, Turkish of Kayseri dialect. He was fluent in it, was able to read and write, and which were essential skills for a merchant. We also know that he knows some Armenian, but we couldn't be sure. Uh, we are not sure, to, quite sure about to what extent he knew Armenian. He learned how to write Armenian too, while he was at the community schools, the national schools, while he was in Kayseri. He used some words in Armenian in the text, which was Turkish. And I will give some examples of the usage of such words, because I believe that will tell you something, or in general tells us, something about the person, the figure Setrak Timurya. And uh, they give an ad, they add a flavor to the text, but they show the identity of the author. There are some words in the text which are used only in Armenian, and most of these were related to religion, such as jam, the church, kahana, priest, tawum or tawum, which is burial, besak, marriage, and uh, tampanagan, the funeral talk, the talk, the speech that you uh, give at a talk, azgayin uh, as the national, nahadak as martyr. Same for the holidays, zatik or zanut. So the, these were the words that were only used in Armenian. And uh, sometimes they were used with Turkish, forming sentences like the following. Again, something that you did not see in the text as it was transliterated and then translated, but it gives you an idea about the text itself if you were reading the original manuscript. Giragileri çapıyı giyerek jamda okuridim. Giregi, Shapik, Jam, they were all Armenian, but the rest of the sentence is Turkish. I wear shirts uh, on Sundays and I read that he was in the chorus, I read in the church. Another example, Avedaran okuyup ve onun açık karozunu dinlerdim. I read Bible and then I listen to his sermon which was open or which could be understood easily. Again, Avedaran, the Bible, and Garoz, sermon. Uh, were, in, were in Armenian, dressed in Turkish. Sometimes uh, Setrak Timurian used Armenian words with Turkish equivalents in parentheses that were also, you know, might be lost in the translation that uh, he used, Ibtidai Naha Badra Sagan, that is a primary school, that Ibtidai or Hoja in parentheses, Varjabet, Pasefe in parentheses, that is philosophy. And sometimes some lay words, and these were not religious words, were used with, without Turkish equivalents. So only in Armenian, but these were not religious words or related to religion. Teraganutyun, which means scrubber, tupavanutyun, arithmetics, I bank kim, alphabet, short, porzogutyun, for operation. Likewise, the names of the names of months, such as Augustos, October, October, December, etc., were all in Armenian within this text. And there were some phrases only in Armenian, such as Halatsum uh, Daratsum Gepere, that oppression brings expansion, while he was talking about uh, uh, or giving an example from a, of a historic um, event. And Ayrat Sirdi, Cher Mikiha Tahrutyun, that is no consolation for a burnt heart when he was talking about the marriage of his daughter and leaving the house. And uh, this was also, we see the impact of English in the language. And since we couldn't translate the English into English, we use them as it is. But uh, there were some words only in English in the Armenian script. And it took some time for us to understand what was going on. Wholesale, a light, income, cash, payment, acre, will, and notice. These were some of the words which he used in Armenian. I don't know whether there's something called Armeno English in that sense, that is English in Armenian script, but that is what we have in the text. So, uh, and there were some mistakes in the spelling of some words 
which gives us an idea about his knowledge that uh, of the of uh, of spelling of these words. For instance, garoz was uh, written with a kim rather than a ke. Gontak it was uh, should be contact, and uh, there were a few other words which I will not get into detail, which had some uh, um, spelling mistakes, misspellings. These uses of a word provides us some ideas about the identity and personality of Tetrarch Timurian. And I think we should be cautious while reaching conclusions, but I will try to give some ideas. And use of religious words in original Armenian and some phrases in Armenian in a Turkish text shows us the position of these social and cultural institutions in Tetrarch Timurian's life. They not only form an identity, but they also distinguish one, that is Setrak Timurian, from the others by emphasizing his belonging to a well-defined group. In this case, Setrak Timurian, although a Turkish speaker, he belonged to the Armenian community, which was, above all, religiously defined. And when you read the memoirs, you will easily notice how religious and um, pious uh, Setrak Timurian was. And the words which were not religious, but used in Armenian without Turkish, such as Tvapanukyun, uh, arithmetics, is rather curious. These were not sacred words. This is not Jam, right? Or Kahana. But however, when you read Setrak Timurian's life closely in the memoirs, you, you notice there was something also very important for him alongside religion, and that was education. He was critical of the level of education in Kayseri, a point that I made in the conference about Kayseri uh, that Negi organized. But there is something else that I should add here, that Tetrak Timurian noted down all the courses he took in his early and only education in the community, in the national Azgayin schools in Kayseri. He always wanted to study further, which he couldn't, as he had to work. Therefore, I sense, but this is only a sense, use of words in Armenian shows his affection, a way of yearning for something he didn't possess, proper education. Thus, Heraganutyun or Tupavanutyun may not be sacred for an ordinary person. However, I think they were for Setrak Timurian. I also would like to talk briefly about Setrak Timurian's editing process of his own manuscript that Timurian read his manuscript over and over again that couldn't be reflected in the book, but that it was there. And I think we should also uh, talk about it briefly. We are lucky to have the editing process as they were reflected on the manuscript. We know that the manuscript was written in different time periods as both the pen and the handwriting change from the content of the writing, comparing it with important and traceable historical developments, we have a rough timeline about the preparation of the manuscript. So the text, the original manuscript is written, or Tetrak Timurian began to write it during World War I, while he was already in the US, probably in 1917 or 18. This is based on the content of the text. Then we see constant additions, particularly about his life in Fresno for a, for a few years. And then he slowed down in pace. The gaps between writings increased. While he was writing new entries, Setrak Timurian read his text over and over again and added things. So that was something very lively. And that was for us, for Murat and I, uh, for me, that, were, that was something very interesting because we see a text that was organic. Corrections are rare or even non-existent. However, there were additions in the full form of footnotes, and they were quite common. There were many footnotes or writings on the margins which were added later to the text. What is interesting is that the text wasn't very well edited too, because for instance, Petrak Timurian told an anecdote from his childhood in the text, and then a couple of pages later, once again, this time in a footnote, he added uh, the same anecdote because probably he felt that he forgot to add that information. So he read 
then probably forgot and then he added uh, some kind of an information later. That's why I'm, I mean by an organic text. So that was not static. So that I think that's very important and that uh, something unique and uh, for us because since we were dealing with the uh, with the manuscript, we were able to see those things. Some of the notes on the text, which were added later, also reflect Petrarch Timurian's inner world too. And for me, the most dramatic uh, one was a note about the passing away of his wife, Naza. He simply wrote, Nazen'in ölümünün tarihi 1922. The translation, the date of that of Nazen, 1922. So that was on the top of the page, written with a pencil. It may look so distant and detached at the first glance from our point of view. However, when you read it on the top of the page, edit later with a pen or as a pencil, that, that simple line turns into a more emotional exclamation for the old man. He felt the need to add that. He felt the need to add something very painful for him, loss of his wife, on the top of that page. He didn't want that information that the passing away of Nazanin to turn into yet another line in the manuscript. He didn't want it to turn it into a piece of knowledge alongside many others that he talks in the memoir, but rather to show its importance for him. It was a turning point in his life. This addition of a simple, and for me, a very powerful line is the law is a loss for the modern edition. However, it tells a lot about this man and his relations with his family and the outer world around him. And this is what I hope you will enjoy in the book. Thank you. Thank you, Tolga. I appreciate that uh, insight into the process. What we're going to do now uh, is to share uh, some of the uh, photos from the book, because I think that will help you to get a flavor of uh, of the book. And then also in the chat, I'm now uh, putting I'm now putting uh, where you can uh, get a copy of the book, either Abriel Books, uh, which is based in Los Angeles or on the East Coast at the uh, Nasser Bookstore. Uh, where the books are available, so th that's where you can do that. But let's let's take a brief look at the uh, photos. Then, uh, if you have questions from the audience, please begin to write those questions in the chat. And then I'll also uh, ask our uh, panel participants if they have questions for each other. We'll do a, a brief discussion following that. But let's take a look at uh, some of the photos. Uh, this is the this is the cover of the photo, and I might say that I want to thank uh, the, our cover designer. Her name is Karen Kluman. She lives in actually in the East Coast in Maine. And she has done uh, a lot of work for the Armenian Studies program uh, in designing our, our books. And I, I really like the design of this book uh, as well. And then some of the photos, many of the photos came from the Nazali Elmasian collection, uh, Setrak and Nazen standing, Timurian, with their children, Anarig and Onik. You can, of course, read the captions. I'm not going to uh, read all of them. Uh, again, the family portraits are, are very important. Uh, and again, one of the connections, of course, that we felt here at the Armenian Studies Program was the Fresno connection that that uh, Setrak spent the last few years of his life uh, in Fresno, bought a farm here, and he tells the story of how that farm uh, was part of his uh, his life. So this is another collection here. And then the extended family, the Telfayan, Timurian, and Bashian families. Uh, these photos were courtesy of Project Save based in Watertown, Massachusetts. Uh, I particularly like this photo of Setrak in his later years, uh, along with where he lived with his daughter for uh, a time. Again, with his uh, children, Anarig and Onik in New York. Again, the story, the, the 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 memoirs tell of his travels to the United States and ultimately to, to Fresno. Uh, this is the Telfayan Company uh, Oriental Rug uh, store in uh, Constantinople, late 19th century. And then the harvesting in, in Fresno. So it gives you a picture of how harvesting in the uh, raisin industry, grape industry. And then a page from Setrak Timurian's passport uh, issued to him by the Ottoman Empire in 1912. 
Uh, we've mentioned the uh, exhibit, which was uh, held at the Eskijian Museum uh, together with the Armenian Dress and Textile Project. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, description. And really, uh, I haven't been to Nazali's home, but I do need to visit there because uh, from all descriptions, it really has maintained that. And then finally, uh, actually, uh, a postcard from Kayseri, a kind of a Christmas card. The family, uh, again, at a later age. And then Nazali herself with her sister, Nazali standing on the right with her sister, Eleanor. And then finally, uh, her great-grandchildren, Setrak Timurian's great-grandchildren, uh, Dylan and Shannon, together with Nazali in the, in the center. So I think this gives us a, a picture of uh, what was going on. Yes, Tolga? Or somebody was asking and wanted to add something. So now I'd like to, uh, I'm going to pin all of our uh, speakers. It's going to take just a moment to do that. And then also. Okay, so uh, we'll take a few minutes. And uh, if you have any questions or comments you would like to, from the audience, uh, address to our uh, panelists, please include that uh, in, in a written format in your chat, which uh, then I will read the questions and then we'll answer it. And while you're doing that, uh, I just have a couple of questions or if there's any questions uh, that the panelists have for each other. Uh, but I'm gonna start by going back to Murad because uh, I was interested in the, in the bibliography and the total number of, uh, of works that are in Armeno-Turkish but in your estimation, how many have actually been worked on? In other words, how many have either been translated or, or written about? Do you have any idea about that as far as the? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, this, as I said, is thanks to Hasmik Stepanyan. This is what we have, the, the more or less 2,000 books. And almost one third of these are religious books. And then there is literature, linguistics, educational books, Law, history, calendars, songbooks, cookbooks, science books, painting, music, and it's 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 an unbelievable. I mean, uh, variety of texts in Armeno Turkish we have. That's on. That's one thing. The other thing, uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, the um, attraction towards Armeno Turkish. Uh, began to take place in Turkey around the millennium. I mean, around the year 2000s, whatever. The first text that was printed in Turkish uh, in Latin alphabet was uh, Akabi Hikayesi, as far as I know. Apart from a minor transliteration of drama by Metinant uh, from the 19th century. So the first book that was printed in Turkish, in Armeno Turkish, was our Akabi case. The first novel written in the Turkish language. It was printed in the capital in 1851 by Josep Vartanyan. Uh, that was the book. But after the 2000s, after, uh, especially after the assassination of Grant, uh, there was a growing interest in Armeno Turkish books. Uh, I edited uh, and printed two uh, Armeno-Turkish texts. One, uh, a testimony by a survivor from Ankara, a Catholic Armenian, Simon Arakelian. Uh, his, his, his testimony was printed in Armeno-Turkish in 1922. Now, that, that made the second edition in three or four years in Turkey. And then another uh, pamphlet by Josep Vartanyan, printed in 1852. It was a it was a satirical piece, like 30, 40 pages, illustrated. It was on the mm, uh, on the perils of talking too much. It was like sketches one after the other. Uh, the younger generation is more interested in uh, um, like maybe more than literature, cookbooks, songbooks, lyrics. Uh, and there are people working on these, uh, but I, I'm not sure if many of them were published. So I can say in, in today's Turkey, 
Uh, there are a number of Armeno-Turkish texts printed available to audience. It, let's say mm, less than 10. Uh, more and more people are interested in manuscripts and Armeno-Turkish press, by the way. I mean, I know at least three or four uh, PhD stu students working on Armeno-Turkish press, and I'm sure there'll be wonderful publications coming out of these. Uh, there are a number of novels I worked on, and I know uh, some other people worked on. Uh, hopefully, they'll be coming out in the following years. That, that's what I know. Thank you. Uh, Tolga, I have a question for you. Now, th it's very interesting because uh, it's Armenian letters, Armeno-Turkish, Armenian letters, but it's Turkish. Now, we we as a group uh, and IPEC went through the whole process of translating it, bringing it into English to bring it to a wider audience. But now I'm thinking, uh, what would be the value? How would you assess the value of retranslating it now back to Turkish, right? And would a Turkish audience find such a work interesting and why? So maybe you could talk about that. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, it wouldn't be a translation, but the transliteration, maybe with some uh, the use of words in contemporary Turkish, uh, so I don't know the, what is the right for, word for it, <laughs> because it's something between transliteration and translation. Maybe Murat can help me. But definitely it will be very useful and it would attract attention uh, from different groups because the text is amazing. We do not have amazing in various levels, in my opinion, because for me uh, and foremost, that is the life story of an Armenian and from Anatolia, from Kayseri, from the 1860s. This is unique. This is very important. And the people would love to learn more about it. And uh, that is, he was, and he is, he is not an intellectual. He is not one of the other types. He didn't work for the Ottoman state. So he wasn't a revolutionary. He was, a, in quote unquote, an ordinary man, a merchant who was you know, seeking to have a better life for himself and for his family. And I think that should be learned by many people, that kind of story. And in Turkey, as Murat said, there is a growing interest in Armenian Turkish texts, but also in the lives of uh, Armenians in general. Therefore, if the text is published in Turkish uh, after a transliteration <laughs> or whatever the word, right word is, then uh, it will uh, receive, I believe, a great at, uh, attention from the audience. And uh, and as I said, there are many uh, different reasons for this, in addition to the fact that, as I said, like uh, this is the life story of an ordinary man, then we don't hear the voices of ordinary men often. Uh, there's other aspects too. Uh, I mentioned that he is a merchant. We do not hear a more, um, we do not hear about the merchants too. We have, in Tur especially in Turkey, we have certain stereotypes, unfortunately, about, for instance, non-Muslim, uh, Christian and Jewish merchants. And uh, I think that would challenge those stereotypes too. Or in terms of the relations between different ethnic communities, we also have our biases uh, from the Muslim point of view or from the Christian point of view. But when you read such a text written in the middle of the previous century, of the 19th century, and uh, in talking you about an Anatolian town where the Armenians, it, even though they didn't form the majority, it was they were quite a big Armenian community in Kayseri, and it was considered as a, one of the Armenian uh, towns in in the in the in central Anatolia. Then uh, definitely that will give a different perspective on those interethnic and interreligious relations too. So from different perspectives. And for me, the most important one is learning the ordinary person's life and also challenging those biases that the text uh, uh, publication of the text will be very important. Thank, Thank you, you for bringing this. Yeah. Thank you. May I add something to this? Sure. sure. Yes. First, uh, as for your question, I answered the Armeno Turkish text published in Turkish. I forgot to mention two important texts published by Aras. One by Vahram Altunyan, his testimony written, uh, I mean, it's a manuscript. Uh, and then uh, the memoirs of uh, Avedis Cebecian, an officer who served in the Ottoman army during the First World War, two important Armeno-Turkish texts. 
So th there is something going on there. And I know that people are uh, interested. I mean, when I published the Ankara Bukwata by Simon Arakelian, Catholic Armenian who was deported from Ankara and somehow managed to survive, I received many emails from readers and not from not only from people who were interested in Armenian history or culture in Turkey, I received email ideologically from Turkish right as well, which were amazed by the text and were very surprised and thanked me. I mean, it was unbelievable. So I'm sure Setrak Timurian's manuscript published in Latin letters in Turkish with a few editorial touch would would attract the audience uh, very much. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I mean, uh, no doubt about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Barlo, next uh, book launching will be in Kayseri. <laughs> yeah, it should be. It should be. Yeah. Maggie, I have a question for you now. You have the uh, you held the exhibit at the Eskijan Museum. For anyone that would like to visit, do you still have parts of that on exhibit? Or is there a way to see anything from uh, the book, anything related to the book, manuscripts, pictures? Most of, not the pictures, but the uh, most of the heirlooms that, the costumes that Nazali's wedding uh, costumes, Nazali's uh, mother's uh, beautiful engagement dress, it's on display in the museum. And to just tell us your hours so people would know to come to we visit. We are open on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays between 11 to 5, and by appointment as well. If they send us an email that they happen to be in town, we had a group that came in from Sweden. I was surprised, and they were interested in Armenian history, and they just showed up. And they came in on a Tuesday. So if they are in town, um, definitely they can give us an email or call us by appointment. We will be op we will open for them. Thank you. Uh, well, yeah. you know, I, I want to uh, again on behalf of uh, the Armenian Studies Program and our Armenian series, I want to thank first of all uh, Maggie for bringing uh, the memoir uh, to to our attention. Uh, to ours, and then all of the work that our uh, translator, Ipek Hüner, and our uh, editors, Murat Jankara, Vayetashyan, Tolga Jora, uh, uh, myself as as also one of the editors who, uh, who became engrossed in the story. I mean, you cannot begin uh, to look at this so many times without really becoming, again, as someone said, part of the family, and then to see it in Fresno. And, and just recently, I was in the Ararat Cemetery in Fresno, and um, I was in uh, showing showing someone around the Ararat Cemetery, and I came upon uh, the the tomb of of uh, Setrak Timurian, and so now uh, I know where he is in Fresno, and that kind of in a sense uh, closed the circle for me uh, in in this uh, in this journey of publishing this book. So I encourage everyone to tell their friends and family. I have posted in the in the chat the uh, way that you can get the book. And once again, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And uh, we'll see you again at one of our future events. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.